I think the question of consciousness, understanding its place in nature and its relation to the physical world is the biggest mystery that we face today. And that's why I decided to work on it. And I'm not alone. Many scientists consider the problem of consciousness among the most important open questions of the 21st century. But for me, the question of consciousness is a question about the nature of reality itself. Today, I'd like to invite you to compare your conscious experience of this very moment to that of a good virtual reality game. Not just a movie in the head or a simulation on a computer, but a game in which you can actively participate, in which you can choose your actions and in which you have to learn from the choices you've made. Explaining how the game works would mean explaining everything that is going on in this very moment. How the spaces you see are created, the sounds you hear, the smells you experience, and the felt presence of your body. In fact, if you had to first think about how the game works in order to play it, this would make it impossible to sit here and listen to me. Much less keep track of anything that is going on outside of this theater. So let's keep playing. While you decide on the next best move, you're anxious about the outcomes of the game, and you remember the good moves you've made in the past. You experience yourself as the center of this all, fully immersed, as they say, as the self around which the whole game unfolds. Now I'm going to give you an easy task and leave the hard bits for me. I ask you, as an audience member, to imagine that it's not just a game, but it's actually real. It's not just your experience that is immersive, but all of us are seeing roughly the same thing. Evolution made us too. That's a simple task if you already accepted a game. You accepted the reality that your brain, a bag of chemicals, presents to you. Beyond being more enjoyable to play the game this way, there is a good reason for you to play it this way. A reason for the tricks and hacks of evolution. Their efficiencies keep us alive. The really hard part of the problem is to discover what these tricks and hacks are simplifying and what lies behind them. Now, obviously, the taste of strawberries, the smell of a rose, or the sight of the morning sun, those things are real. Or could I be wrong about that? But I also believe that these inner subjective experiences are part of nature just as much as anything else. And we don't need to limit this to humans. We are probably not the only beings that experience the world this way. Perhaps even a bumblebee is conscious of the smell of a blooming rose. But could that be explained by our current physics? How would that work? What machine could create these experiences? The German philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was quite puzzled by this. He said, if you were to take such a machine, blow it up to the size of a factory and walk around inside, you could take a look at the machine and see how it works, but you wouldn't find consciousness anywhere. You would only find gears and levers. And in more modern machines, you would find electrical currents or computer chips, mechanisms of delivering sensory information, but no taste, smells, or sights. Fast forward 300 years, and we're still with this problem, but now we can use our best brain science to investigate it. Imagine you're listening to your favorite piece of music. It might evoke faint images of your past, let your experience nostalgia make you feel sad or send shivers down your spine. Researchers could take a look at what's happening in your brain and correlate its activity with your experiences. But would this also explain why we have these experiences? Why it feels so sad and sweet at the same time while your brain is passing around electrical signals? Why does it feel like anything at all? The philosopher David Chalmers called this the hard problem of consciousness. The problem of explaining precisely why and how information processing in the brain would give rise to conscious experience. This problem has stayed with us ever since it was first articulated. No one seems to have an idea, not 300 years ago and not now. The cognitive scientist Steven Pinker put it particularly eloquently. Beats the heck out of me. Many correlates between consciousness and patterns of neural activity are known, but at present we can't explain why these correlations exist or what they tell us about the relation between consciousness and the brain. We don't have a theory that would explain why one piece of music makes us feel sad and another one makes us happy. Even when we know correlations, we don't always understand cause. 
For example, the homicide rate is correlated to the sales of ice cream. When ice cream sales go up, the homicide rate goes up, and vice versa. Does this mean that eating ice cream makes you more likely to be a murderer? Or that committing murder makes you crave Ben and Cherries? Of course not. In a case of the correlation between ice cream sales and the homicide rate, we have a good explanation at hand. It is the heat of summer which affects both. We don't have a similar story for the relation between consciousness and the brain. Does brain activity cause consciousness? Is it the other way around? Or is there a hidden cause that underlies both? We don't know. Countless generations of really intelligent people, many of whom I admire, fail to solve this puzzle. And anyone who says there is no problem, don't listen. Compare this to astronomy. Ancient astronomers were quite good at constructing tables that would tell you which phenomenon in the sky to expect at what time. But it took many hundred years until Isaac Newton could explain the dynamics of the heavens with his equations. I hope that one day the same could be done for consciousness. But just a little bit faster. Why did it take astronomers so long? It is because they were missing an important insight into the nature of reality. They were missing that the Sun, and not the Earth, stands at the center of the solar system. The same, I argue, is true for understanding consciousness. We are missing an important insight. It is easy to assume that we know more about the nature of reality than we actually do. For example, many believe that there is this material world, that we somehow perceive this world more or less accurately, and perhaps even that we could somehow build machines which do this in a way which grants them conscious experience. Well, time to look at some scientific facts. Our perceptions constantly fool us. Here are some examples. A visual illusion known as the Necker cube is shown on this slide. The Necker cube is a two-dimensional drawing of a cube that could be perceived in one of two ways, with the shaded area on the screen either in the back or in the front. Normally the image will flip after a while. Images such as these lead to a switch between two perceptions, even though the visual input always stays the same. There is no three-dimensional cube, just a two-dimensional drawing. Our minds constructed it. Another example is about the sounds we hear. Listen to this recording. What do you hear? I play it again for you. Do you hear anything? Now listen to this. Where were you a year ago? A clear voice. Listen again to the first example. Where were you a year ago? Do you hear it now? But of course, there is no voice. Our minds constructed it. Perception is not just a reproduction of what is there. It is more like an interpretation of what we sense. Could the same be true about our experience of reality? When I see an apple in front of me, I usually take it for granted that there really is a red and round object in front of me. This assumption is intuitive, but is it true? Well, think again of the Necker cube. We perceive a three-dimensional cube, but in reality it's just a two-dimensional drawing. Now it's one thing to dismiss such intuitions, but it is another to actually prove them wrong. Our lab wanted to study this more precisely, relying on mathematics and computer models rather than on our intuitions. And what we found surprised us. One proof involved evolution by natural selection. You would perhaps expect that seeing reality more accurately makes you more fit. But we could show mathematically that organisms that see reality this way go extinct when competing against organisms of equal complexity that only care about procreating to pass on their genes. So seeing the truth might get you into real trouble. The world is most likely not as it seems to be. It is most likely not a world made of distinct objects, such as apples in a 3D space. But most of us still believe this is the way the world is, mainly because the world looks like that. Just as we once believed that the sun revolves around the Earth. What's more, evolution might have hidden what is really there and fooled us into believing that other things are real instead. And certainly, we can't see inner subjective experiences. Instead, all we see is a material world. I give you an analogy. If you look at your own face in the mirror, what you see is skin, hair, and eyes. But there's a lot that you can't see. You can't see hopes, you can't see fears, you can't see desires. 
You cannot even see a headache, but these are real experiences. The things we see are what we need to see. They don't mean anything more than what our distant ancestors needed to see in order to survive. And evolution made sure that we regard them as real. Cut your head open and you will find your brain busy processing all the things you see. You can even record its neural activity. But as Leibniz already said, we will likely never find hopes, fears, desires or headaches from staring at it. We've barked up the wrong tree all along. What is really going on here? Let's try to understand why the physical world looks the way it does, but starting with inner subjective experience. To study this idea, my colleagues and I are working on a mathematical model of a network of agents that have experiences and interact with each other. We want to understand how these interactions lead to the emergence of perceptions of a material and shared world. One can illustrate this with a familiar metaphor. Our realities are like a huge social network. Take Facebook, for example. Billions of agents are connected to each other and send messages around every day. They post about their experience. They could like what they see. They could share it or they could just ignore it. You are not alone in the universe. The network is inherently social and it is inherently comprised of the relations between agents. Your success in a network depends mostly on the actions of others whether they like what you post, whether they make friends with you, whether they want to hear more of what you have to say, whether you learn from these experiences and make better posts. This is doable as long as the network is small. But as the network gets bigger, this becomes vastly more complicated. Just to give you a feel for the numbers. Facebook creates roughly 4,000 terabytes of new data every day. That's about 4 million hours of streaming HD videos on Netflix. So the problem to successfully navigate this world is enormous. But the social network has algorithms that simplify what you see, when you see it, and how you see it. Without that simplification, you would not have a small and manageable stream of data. Instead, you would face a torrent of information that flies by you so fast, you couldn't possibly make sense of it. These algorithms make you perceive all that's going on in a highly simplified and user-friendly way. They would hide the truth from you. And they would make room for ads too. Your perceptions are just a quick and dirty solution to a big data problem and nothing more. And that includes a material brain. The problem of consciousness is about understanding why it is so puzzling and why our current ways to do science seem so limited. I've claimed this has to do with the way how we perceive reality. Something that feels so natural, but might in fact just be a trick played on us by evolution. I've compared our perceptions to solutions to a big data problem posed by a network of agents. Beings which are possibly quite unlike us, but which could experience and interact with each other. Will the theory of sketch be wrong? Most certainly. But in any case, and through developing and testing such theories, we will find something that will surprise us. And just as the belief that the Earth stands at the center of the galaxy appears to us now, so will our assumptions about the nature of reality appear to future generations. Compared to this, going to the moon will look like a minor achievement. I have suggested that we are taking part in a big game played right now by a society of agents. A game to which evolution made us agree, but a game nevertheless. So what lies behind it? What is the game all about and who will we be when we stop playing it? Thank you very much.